Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to the worship service globally this day in Jesus' name. Amen. And I pray that the preaching of the word, the entrance of the word, will bring light in every life, every family, every ministry, every church, every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless your name because you have gathered us together. And we come, O oh Lord, to the table of the Lord, wanting to dine, for man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth out of the mouth of the Lord. Lord, feed us, empower us, envision us, energize us, that we will go forth in the strength of the meal, in the strength of the manna, and then will deliver your message to the world waiting for us to give them the bread of life. Let life come into us and through us into multitudes of people. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. Today, as we come to this special service, I will bring what we have been doing from Thursday night, Friday, Saturday. This morning, we we'll bring everything to a climax. We're coming to the whole book of Jonah. We're looking at chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4. In chapter 1, we're looking at Jonah chapter 1 from verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying in verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness is come before me. And then in verse 3, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa. And he found a sheep going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. In chapter 2, verse 1, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. Look at verse 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. We're looking at chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Verse 2, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto each the preaching that I bid thee. Verse 3, So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. Verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and he never shall be overthrown. Verse 5. So, the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. From the greatest of them, even to the least of them. Verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. Chapter 4, verse 11. And should not I spare Nineveh, 
that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and also much cattle the book finishes with a question you will see from the beginning the call of god upon jonah and we learn the call of god for you and for me as you look at the book of jonah in that chapter one he represents the second son of the father the prodigal son at the end of the chapter of chapter uh, chapter one he stands for christ the only begotten son of god at the end in chapter four he stands as the elder son that the father said your brother was lost and is found dead but alive and should not we rejoice that ended the question and jonah now acted like the elder son in that parable he wasn't happy that Nineveh turned to the Lord and the elder brother was not happy that the father received the prodigal son. Look at them, chapter 1, we find Jonah running from God. Look at chapter 2, we find Jonah running to God. And look at chapter 3, we find Jonah running for God. And then chapter 4, Jonah running against god his life was not consistent his life was up and down one day i will pay the vows that i have vowed another day is so offended at that god he says kill me i don't want to live if Nineveh will live let me die i'm talking to you today on the call to reason with god and rescue the perishing the call to reason with god and rescue the perishing there are four points today because we have one point for chapter one one point for chapter two one point for chapter three and one point for chapter four look at number one point number one the suffering of a prodigal prophet Point number two, the supplication under his perplexing pain. Number three, the service of a persuasive preacher. And then number four, the selfishness of a protesting personality. He was protesting against God because of what God had done. Let's come to number one. Number one, the suffering of a prodigal prophet. Three things we're looking at here. Look at number one, the call beyond his borders. And the call beyond our borders. He called Jonah beyond his own territory. And beyond the, the circumference, perimeter of his nation. He called him outside, beyond his borders. And that's the call the Lord has given us. He's calling us beyond our borders beyond our local church beyond our ministry beyond our denomination beyond our stage beyond our country he called him beyond his borders number two the cause of his backsliding and the reason for our backsliding number three is the consequence of his behavior the consequence of our behavior look at number one the call beyond his borders our borders it tells us in jonah chapter one reading from verse uh, reading from verse one now the word of the lord came unto jonah the son of Amittai, saying now verse two saying arise go to Nineveh that great city and cry against it for their wickedness has come up 
before me if you look at second kings chapter 14 you'll find that jonah had been working for god serving the lord preaching the word and prophesying he was doing that within his own border we call that the comfort zone it was very easy for him he loved that he appreciated that within that little circle in the comfort zone he could do whatever the lord wanted him to do in second kings chapter 14 verse 25 he restored the coast of israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain according to the word of the lord god of israel which is spake by the hand of his servant jonah the son of amittai the prophet which was of gath heifer as long as he was in the convenient place in the comfortable place in the comfort zone no problem he was obedient but now god called him outside beyond his borders and you're like that you are in this area of work as long as you are there you're used to that habitually that is what you do that's your comfort zone and god says arise and go to this other place and this is not a comfortable place for you you are out of the comfort zone then you begin to turn and you begin to uh, say god why this why that should I should I not the call beyond your borders let's look at Ezekiel chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 5 for thou art not said to a people of a strange speech of an hard language but to the house of Israel and then in verse 6 it says not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language whose words thou canst not understand surely had I sent thee Ezekiel to them of a different language of a hard language of a different lifestyle of hard the understood that we cannot understand of their lifestyle if i sent you to them they would have hearkened unto thee now as you look at your ministry what are you ready to do and what are you telling god oh god send me here don't send me there oh god allow me to do this but not that oh god if life is easy if life is comfortable i'm going to serve you but please god don't call me beyond my brothers i'm a southerner don't call me to the north i'm a northerner don't call me to the south i am a south sir don't call me to the southeast and please god you can call me to do anything i'm in the southwest but don't call me to the northeast that's the problem when we're called beyond our borders then we we'll begin uh, to kind of slow down and drag our feet we're not ready the call that came to jonah is the call that came to him to go outside beyond his borders let's look at number two here number two we're looking at the cause of his backsliding and the reason and the cause that people follow in their backsliding jonah chapter one we're looking at verse three in jonah chapter one verse three but jonah rose up to flee unto tashish from the presence of the lord and he went down to joppa and he found a ship going to touch it. So he paid is the fear thereof and went down into it to go with them, to go with them, to go with them. They didn't have the supernatural call. To go with them. They didn't have the pointed, pointed call to go with them we're called into the kingdom we're called into his service there are many people multitudes of people in the world they don't even know why they are here in the world and they are sailing and they are running and they're going everywhere and they cannot tell where they're going why they are going and where they are going to meet there and there are people that joined them 
the church people of no purpose people of no destination and people of no calling and people that do not have that have not identified why they are here on the earth to go with them he went down with them onto tashish there was no business for jonah in tashish where you are where you are running to what you are trying to do no business for you what you are trying to get what you are trying to have what you are trying to accomplish there's nothing there for you that god has appointed but he was fleeing from the presence of the lord he wanted to get to a place where the voice of the lord will not reach him then we are told in verse 4 in verse 4 it says but the lord said out a great wind to the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the sheep was like to be broken look at verse 5 in verse 5 it says then the mariners were afraid unnecessary fear and he cried every man unto his god wasted breath in crying and wasted breath in praying because those are dead gods they cannot hear and the god of heaven will not hear if a man uses all his breath all his saliva all the energy of his life and he's talking to dead god and the living god is not listening to him a waste of life they even fast a waste of their energy and they fast until they become as dry as a stick and yet they are praying to the unknown god and god does not answer the prayer we pray while we're in rebellion running away from god or assisting somebody that is running away from god and we're told and they cast forth the whales that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them but jonah the real problem but jonah was gone down into the sides of the sheep and he lay and was fast asleep Some, sometimes the cause of our problem what well, we're crying and praying and fasting and seeking the face of the lord the cause of our problem is fast asleep the lord has called us and he said go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and then the rich man comes to join our ministry and then we preach the word of repentance and we say we must repent from the greed and from the kind of the avarice gathering 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 you don't know when you'll die and the rich man says come pastor I came to your church, I wanted to help you, and I wanted to lift you up. I have the money, I am not a preacher, but what can you do without money? You cannot preach without money, you cannot build, look at those sanctuaries that people build, you cannot build that without money, and I came to you so that I will assist you. And you're preaching like that, no bribery, no corruption. If I didn't take bribes, if I didn't practice corruption, do you think I'll have what I have now? If you do that again, and you say that again i'll pack all my things and go to another church you say i am sorry you say sorry to a sinner you're backsliding already you're like a jonah and then when you now come he sits right there in the front and he wears a kind of dress you can easily identify and once you see him there he's your god you dare not say what you will not have broke up and when you get into trouble you are praying you are crying you are fasting the man he doesn't know to pray it's uh, you know so dull spiritually he doesn't pray it's just there the man that causes your trouble is fast asleep jonah was fast asleep while the people were praying the cause of his backsliding it was going down and down and down look at proverbs chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 15 proverbs chapter 13 reading from verse 15 
sin is telling us a sin in the latter part there the second part but the way of transgressors is hard the way of backsliders is hard the way of rebellious people is hard the way of the people that know the word of god and they walk contrary to the word of god their way is sad the way of the people that know the will of god the calling of god and the anointing of god upon their lives and because of the fear of man and because they want the favor of man they go in the opposite direction like jonah the way of the transgressor is hard that's his backsliding. Let's look at number three now. Number three is the consequence of his behavior. The consequence of our behavior. We're looking at Jonah chapter 1 and we're looking at verse 7. It says in Jonah chapter 1 verse 7, And they said everyone to his fellow, Come and let us cast laws that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us so they cast lots and the lot fell upon jonah and then we're reading from verse 8 it says in verse 8 then said they unto him let us tell us we pray we pray thee we plead with you for whose cause is this evil upon us what is thine occupation and whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? And then he told them, I'm a prophet. What are you doing here then? I'm a preacher. What are you doing on Sunday morning? And uh, you know, receiving a visitor, and you are there at home. Your church is there. The ministry is there. I'm waiting for some people coming from the village. What are they coming to do? Are they coming? Are they going to church with you? Direct them to the church. No, they are not coming for church. They are coming for you know. We have some family ideas and some family things to share together you a preacher a pastor a minister a bishop a leader and there you are the place of duty and the place of your calling where you ought to be you have abandoned that what's your occupation from whence comest thou what is thy country and of what people art thou of what people art thou i mean descendant of abraham of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And through him, through all those descendants, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Understand that. Understand that. All the families of the earth will be blessed by the progenitors, by the descendants of Abraham. And here is one of them, one of the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And to fulfill that covenant with Abraham, Jonah. There's a family there, they don't know about the living God, about the redeeming God, about the saving God. And to fulfill the covenant with Abraham, go tell them. 40 days, if you don't yield, 40 days, if you don't turn, you will perish, you'll be overthrown. And the descendants of Abraham went the other direction. Now, we're told in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 17. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 17. As thou not procured this unto thyself, Jonah, this storm, this wind, this suffering, have you not procured this unto thyself? You say, well, God, you sent a wind. Uh -uh, that wasn't in my plan for you or with you. You were the one that brought the wind upon yourself. You sent the storm. Jonah, don't blame me. That wasn't my plan for you. You brought this upon yourself. What have you lost? Your health? Your peace? Your prosperity? The favor of people? The people that used to hover around you and they'll say, get on, keep on doing it. Everybody loved you. Now, everybody forsakes you and you are there by yourself. 
Who are you blaming? Can you blame God as thou not proclaimed, procured, having this unto thyself, in that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God? when he led thee by the way that's what we need to notice in our lives this should not happen to a child of god i pray i fast i, I claim the promises of god and those promises are not being fulfilled i'm sick i'm suffering i'm totally i'm tired i don't know where to go again i'm confused Look inward, see what is happening, and see what you've done to yourself. As thou not procured this unto thyself, in that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, when he led thee by the way, he told you where to go. He told you what to do. He told you why you were born. He told you why you came in. He told you what he expects of you. And then you followed Jonah that other way. That's the consequence of that behavior. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, thine own wickedness shall correct thee. How wicked it is so to go to Navy and deliver those people. But you say, no, I don't want to be a deliverer. I don't want to be a savior. I don't want to be a rescuer. I don't want to pull anybody from their suffering. Look at that. That's wickedness. And your wickedness shall correct thee. And thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that my fear is not in thee my fear is not in thee anytime we go on the errand and the journey of self-will it means we don't fear God well, we don't what can God do this is the way I'm going to go what can God do? That's the direction I'm going to go. What can God do? That's what I am going to do. When we go on the journey of self-will, when we go on the journey of rebellion and disobedience against the Lord, when we go in our sin, in our evil, as if the Savior has not come, as if the Savior had not died, as if the Savior had not sacrificed for us, when we go in that kind of journey, we do not fear the Lord. And when you have a leader, a pastor, and you know the pastor preaches holiness without which no man shall see the lord you can interpret you can repeat the message to any other person on earth but you yourself you look at that pastor that preacher eyeball to eyeball and you go your own way you do not fear that pastor that leader when your father says this is the way to go and then you look at him and you smile and then that's plastic smile hypocritical smile and then you go your own way you don't fear that father because when you rebel and when you disobey somebody that god has put upon you as an authority and he says this is the way walk in thereby and then you refuse you do not fear god you do not fear the man or the woman that the lord has placed over you says the lord god we're looking at john chapter 5 verse 14 after what jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him behold thou art made whole sin no more Sin no more, lest a worse thing come on thee. Sinful lifestyle has its consequence. Bad behavior has its consequence. Rebellion against the word, the way, the will of God has 
its consequence. We're coming to chapter 2. Uh, point number 2 here. We're looking at the supplication under his perplexing pain. We're looking at Jonah chapter 1. Two, I'm reading from verse one. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, is God out of the fish's belly? And then in verse two, it says, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardst my voice we're looking at three things here number one praying in times of affliction what else can we do praying in times of affliction number two pleading for the tenderness of the almighty pleading for the tenderness of the almighty number three praising with thanksgiving in anticipation we're looking at number one number one praying in times of affliction that's exactly what he did we read that in jonah chapter 2 reading from verse 1 now we look at uh, psalm 107 reading from verse 17 psalm 107 verse 17 fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted people who know the promises of god they claim the promises but they are sitting in the premises of disobedience they claim in the promise of deliverance and yet as you look at their lives they sit in the premise of disobedience and because of their sin because of their iniquities they are afflicted they were told in verse 18 in verse 18 their soul abhorreth all manner of meat and they draw near unto the gates of death because of their foolishness because of their backsliding because of their disobedience and rebellion look at verse 19 verse 19 then they cry unto the lord in their trouble and he saves them out of their distresses will pray in the time of affliction and if we join repentance with that prayer if we join a sober attitude with that prayer if we throw away what is causing our trouble the cigarette causing our trouble we throw away the bottles of alcohol causing our trouble we throw away all the joining or backsliders living like backsliders we throw that away and all the objects of sin that we desired and that were masked to ourselves if we throw that away permanently perpetually that we're not coming to do things anymore then the lord will answer our prayer that's why it says in james chapter 5 reading from verse 13 is any among you afflicted let him pray is any of you afflicted let him pray is any merry let him sing psalms look at this look at this is any of you afflicted then they start singing is any of you afflicted then they start praising god and rejoicing and acting as if nothing had happened at all is any of you afflicted then they pretend as if there's nothing happening and they smile and they laugh and they're exalted that's not the word of god you know what the word of god says is any of you afflicted is judgment coming upon anyone is the storm coming upon anyone is the expectation of somebody being cut short let him pray and then when the lord has done it and you are happy and you are merry it says if anyone merry then let him sing there is a time for singing there's a time for jubilation there's a time for excitement but the time when the consequence of sin is weighing down on us that's not the time to pretend and then to be merry when you're afflicted when there's judgment when there's chastisement when there's rebuke when there's correction what we need to do is to pray 
unto the Lord. Look at number two here. Number two is pleading for the tenderness of the Almighty. That is all we can do. We're pleading for the tenderness of the Almighty. We're not, uh, you know, mis, uh, uh, misconstruing uh, what is happening. We we'll say this is judgment. This is affliction. This is the correction. This is causing me grief because of what I've done. And then uh, we plead for the tenderness of God. It says in chapter 2 verse 4 of Jonah, Then said I, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look toward thy holy temple. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, the waters compass me about even to the soul. The depths closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. It was describing to God what he was going through and the suffering and the shame and the agony that was going through the affliction that came upon him and then in verse 6 it tells us I went down God look at me see where I am now I'm no more in the plain of, uh, of Nineveh I'm not in the mountain top where I used to be when I went to minister unto the people of Israel and I was on top of the world now I'm beneath and below it said I went down to the bottoms of the mountains the earth with her bars was about me forever yet has thou brought me up brought my life up from corruption O lord my god and then in verse seven in verse seven when my soul fainted within me i remembered the lord i remembered god is not like this he does not afflict the children of men willingly i brought this upon myself i was in good fellowship with the lord i was friendly with God and he could talk to me I could talk to him everything was pleasant I was in my comfort zone and I never enjoyed any good fellowship like that before but now see what is happening to me and he said I remember the Lord and my prayer came unto thee into thine holy temple look at Micah chapter 7 we're looking at verse 9 Micah chapter 7 we're looking at verse 9 i will bear the indignation of the lord i understand i'll bear the punishment of my waywardness i will bear the consequence of my rebellion i will bear the indignation of the lord because i have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me he will bring me forth to the light and i shall behold his righteousness somebody there say amen, amen. say amen. amen number three number three is praising with thanksgiving in anticipation in anticipation of what god will do in anticipation that god is a god of love a god of mercy a god of compassion in anticipation of what he will do look at jonah chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 8 they that observe lying vanities are lying to themselves they're lying to themselves that now they've come into the kingdom and therefore god will not require of them any duty any responsibility they only get and get and get from god they get favor from god they get mercy from god they get compassion from god they get the goodness of god they get and get and they never give they never give they never give back with obedience with holiness with righteousness and they assume that everything will be all right that's lying vanity they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy and then he tells us in verse 9 in verse 9 but i will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving in anticipation that there'll be restoration in anticipation that there'll be the rescue in anticipation there'll be forgiveness in anticipation that god will reverse this negative situation and turn it positive i will i will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving 
giving, I will pay that that I have vowed. Do you even remember the vows? When I came to the Lord, the very first week I came to the Lord, I know what I told the Lord, 1964, April. And since that time, I never forgot that this is what I told the Lord. And then before I got sanctified, 1965, I can see where I knelt. I can see what I was telling the Lord. I had read a Christian message. And then that thing broke my heart. And I, I was there. I can see the room at the university now. And I can see what I vouch to the Lord. And as I've gone on and on and on, I can remember the vows I made to the Lord. And every turn of the way, every crossroad, I always remember this is what I said unto the Lord, and this is what he said unto me. And I've made up my mind, I will pay that that I vowed. Have you ever vowed anything, consecrated anything? Have you ever laid anything on the altar and you only sing, only sing unto Jesus, I surrender? What have you surrendered unto even things that of no consequence. Have you surrendered them? The things that have no value, have you surrendered them? Not to talk of things that are very important, almost indispensable to the human life. What have you consecrated? And what have you vowed? Jonah said, I forgot my vow, the vow of the prophet. Anywhere you send me, I will go. I forgot that when I heard Nineveh, now I am ready to go on and pay the vow that I have vowed. The vow of the prophet. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation, restoration is of the Lord. And he did that with thanksgiving in anticipation that he will do what he had promised God. We come to point number three now in point number three the service of a persuasive preacher we're coming to jonah chapter three and we're reading from verse one and the word of the lord came unto jonah the second time you think that if we keep on saying no god that cannot be i will not you that if you're sending me to Nineveh and I've told you I will not if you send the storm I will not if you send suffering I will not God is of one mind and you are also of one mind his mind your mind they collide there's conflict here and as long as you say I will do what I will do. I will go this direction. God will say, I will do what I will do. Now, you are in the belly of my will. You are boxed in. You are arrested. You are apprehended. You are inside the will of the Lord. Jonah, what are you going to do? Because opposing God does not pay. Going against God does not pay. Having your own will, self-will, does not pay. He wants to remove that self-will, that Adamic nature, and that kind of disposition to sin, to evil. And if you keep on like that, the will will be carrying you around and up because... And remember, there's no air inside that well for you to breathe. There's no food inside that well for you to eat. There's no water inside that well for you to drink. You have limited time. What are you going to do? I will do what the Lord has called me to do. There's no point fighting against the Almighty. And now we have the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, look at verse 2, arise, go unto Nineveh. He has not changed. The will of God has not changed. The doctrine of the Bible has not changed. And the requirement of the Lord has not changed. Arise, 
go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. The service of a persuasive preacher. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the faithfulness of a powerful pedestrian preacher. He was a pedestrian preacher. He had to move here and go there and go there. No car, no chariot, no motorcycle, nothing. He had to go by, by, by feet and then he has to, you know, preach the word to them. The faithfulness of a powerful pedestrian preacher. Number two, the forgiveness of a persuaded penitent people. Number three, the favor of the patient pardoning potentate. Let's look at number one there. Number one is the faithfulness of a powerful pedestrian preacher. And we will see what Jonah, what Jonah did. Look at Jonah chapter 3 verse 3. In Jonah chapter 3 verse 3, so Jonah arose and he went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three this journey and then in verse 4 in verse 4 it says and Jonah began to enter into the city this journey and he cried and said yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown Jonah that's harsh that's what God gave me to say to Nineveh Jonah, that's not expected. I don't know about that. That's what God told me. He said, go and preach to them the preaching that I bid thee. You're not preaching to satisfy man, to satisfy woman. You're not preaching to win friends and make people, you know, come around you. You're not preaching for a well done, good servant from any of the people. You're preaching to say what the Lord himself once said and so Jonah went on in that place and said yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown that's what the Lord has given us to do he wants us to preach the word look at second Timothy chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 2 second Timothy chapter 4 we're looking at verse 2 preach the word the instant in season out of season reprove rebuke, exhort, without long suffering and doctrine. Look at verse 3. For the time shall, the time will come when they will not endure, embrace sound doctrine, but after their own law shall they heap up to themselves, teachers having each in ears. Then in verse 4 it says, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and they shall be turned unto fables. But whatever they do, whatever they do, whenever they hear, even if they don't hear, look at verse 5 it says but watch thou in all things endure afflictions endure afflictions endure afflictions if I preach that repentance my people in my church they'll go against me endure affliction if I go back to my church and I begin to say blessed are the pure in heart for only they shall say the Lord they say pastor come look at her sign look at her name her name is not deeper life why not? And if I go there and I'm preaching to them, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. Uh, you know, our elders and the committee that appoint uh, their pastors, they're going to come and say, now, we pay you. We're not paying you for holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. We pay you for this. This is our tradition. And this is our doctrine. The Lord is saying, endure affliction. If there's a affliction because you're preaching the Bible. If there's affliction because you're standing for the word of God, watch thou in all things endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. The Lord help every one of us in Jesus' name. We're looking at number two there. Number two there is the forgiveness of a persuaded penitent people. We're looking at Jonah chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. 
Now, they couldn't see God face to face, but they could see his representative. They believed Jonah. They believed God. They couldn't hear God directly. God had not spoken to them. They heard the word that God gave to Jonah. And Jonah faithfully delivered that word. And when they believed what they heard from Jonah, they believed God who had spoken to Jonah and through Jonah. How does it show that you believe God? You don't see God face to face, but you have his word, the Holy Bible. And he sends a minister, he sends a messenger to read to you the word of God and to interpret to you the word of God. And you believe that word, you believe God. You have not seen Calvary. You have not seen Christ on the cross, but it's reaching and reaching recorded by the people, the eyewitnesses that saw him on the cross. And he said, it is finished. You are not there, but the people who heard and the people who saw, they've written everything down. And the minister of God comes and declares to you that your sin can be taken away only by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. When you repent of your sin and you believe the man, the woman, the minister, the preacher who got the word from God, from the Holy Bible, and declared it to you, and you believe that word. That means you believe God. They believe Jonah. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. The same word for the greatest as for the least of them. The same word for the men as for the women. The same word for the older generation as for the younger generation. The same word to everyone. Repent and believe the gospel. And that's what they did. They believed and the favor of God came on them. We're looking at First John chapter 1 verse 9. First John chapter 1. We're reading from verse 9. If we confess our sins, not if we excuse our sins, if we cover up our sins, if we do chameleon practice with our sins, when we're in Rome, we do as the Romans. When we come back to Jerusalem, we do as the people of Jerusalem. Not when we play games or gamble with our sins, with our soul. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our righteousness. He will do it. I said he will do it. When we confess with the mind of forsaking, of forsaking them. Uh, have you wondered what happened to Peter? The Lord called him. He dropped the net, but he did not burn the bridge behind him. He didn't burn the net. He kept the net. One year has gone, not fishing, but Leave it there. I may need it one day. Two years gone. He left the net there. I may need it one day. Three years gone. Now Christ rose from the dead. Looking for him. Where is Peter? Where is Peter? He's going to pick up his net. If he had burnt that net, he wouldn't have seen the time, the chance, the privilege, or the unlucky situation of taking the net again you see when we say we confess then we forsake and we say i'm not drinking anymore if you're not drinking anymore why do you keep the bottles of beer in the fridge i'm not smoking anymore why did you keep uh, you know that the packets of cigarettes there i'm not doing that anymore and that uh, you know old lady and you know uh, that that woman that has made many to fall i'm not going away anymore why are you keeping her picture in your phone on your whatsapp if you're not going to do those things anymore why don't you 
forsake everything and say no more. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May it be done in every life in Jesus' name. And somebody shout, Amen. Amen. We're coming to number three here. Number three, the favor of the patient pardoning potentate. We're looking at Jonah chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 10. Jonah chapter 3, we're looking at verse 10, and God saw their works. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them and he did it not that's the favor of god that brings forgiveness the favor of god that brings pardon on the people who repent on the people who turn let's come to chapter four now in chapter four we're looking at the selfishness of a protesting personality the selfishness of a protesting personality until Jonah, it's difficult to find any prophet that protests against God. God, the potentate, God, the almighty, God, the sovereign, God, the king of kings and the lord of lords, he has acted. He has done what aligns with his nature and we have never heard of another personality prophet protesting against the action of God. Many years ago, in our land, we have not found people protesting. But it started somewhere there and came to that place. And the church, because the church is different. The church is not the world. The world is not the church. And eventually, the world started coming into the church. And now, if the preacher preaches something that that section, that section does not agree with, then we carry placards. No! No, no, we're not going to have that with body language, with placard, and with everything we now protest against the word and the revelation of the Lord. It was never so. The Pharisees and the Sadducees protested against Christ because of what he preached, but the disciples never. And then, as you come to the Acts of the Apostles, there were those Pharisees again, they had not all died, and they protested against what the apostles were preaching. But the members of the church never. Now, apostles, look at what you preach, and look at it. It brought persecution on us, and they were scattered everywhere. All those people that were scattered because they believed the word of God that the apostles had preached, they didn't protest. They were scattered everywhere, and they went everywhere preaching the word. The church is not a protesting church protesting against the Bible, protesting against the doctrine of the word, protesting against the prophets of God, and protesting against the God of heaven. But here we see now the selfishness of a protesting personality. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the anger of an unsanctified patriot. The anger, Jonah, of all people, Jonah, a prophet of God, Jonah, a prayerful person, Jonah, a person that I told God, I will pay that that I vowed. Now he gets angry against you, not against the Nineveh, not against his people, Israel, against the Almighty God, the anger of an unsanctified patriot. Number two, the anxiety of an unsatisfied 
person, the anxiety of an unsatisfied person. Number three, the answer of the unsearchable perfecter. Let's look at number one. Number one is the anger of a, an unsanctified patriot. We're looking at Jonah chapter 4 and we're looking at verse 1. And it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. Brothers and sisters, ministers, bishops, and archbishops, there's something called sanctification. And Jesus prayed for his disciples and all that were followed, sanctify them in, through thy truth, that word is truth. When we're sanctified, the Adamic nature is dealt with. The old man, and that is the root of sin, is dealt with. And we don't even get angry anymore to our wives, to our husbands, to our children. We don't get angry anymore at the congregation. Talk less of being angry against the almighty God. It's the sign of an unsanctified soul, unsanctified heart. This one gets them angry. That one gets them angry. That one gets them angry. And it tells on their face. It tells on their nerves. It tells on their physique. Anger, anger, anger. He wants us to be sanctified. We're saved when we confess our sins unto the Lord. We're sanctified when we consider create a very spirit and very nature unto the Lord and if we're rebuked for anything if we're corrected for anything uh, thank you Jesus thank you Lord I merited that I needed that and you have corrected me so that you can straighten me out and so that I will not miss heaven we don't get displeased with God because of correction but he displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry look at verse 2 in verse 2 it says and he prayed unto the Lord and said I prayed thee O Lord was not this my saying when I was yet in my country therefore I fled before unto Tarshish for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. Look at verse 3 there. In verse 3, therefore now, therefore now, O Lord, take, I pray thee, my life from me. He wanted to die. Anger makes us mental, deranged mad, unthinking, senseless, insensible. Jonah, if you died in this condition, fighting against God, are you going to get to heaven and live with God forever? Can two of you live together, dwell together, if you're not be agreed? If you die now, God, I pray, kill me, destroy me, because he wasn't happy. Because it wasn't sanctified. Go and check out. Anybody who commits suicide, we cannot say he was sanctified. He had peace of mind, he had purity of heart, he had settlement in his heart. And so, because of the peace, he jumps into the front of a speedy vehicle and then he dies. Anybody who commits suicide like that is because he was angry at something. Life is not dealing with me very well, life is not sympathetic with me and life is not supporting me what i wish i don't have what i wish for Nineveh, i don't have what i wish god will do he didn't do it that way god did not come down and come under my authority and come under my control and because god and the people of god will not come under my control it's better for me to die if you die in that condition is hellfire therefore now O oh lord take i beseech thee my life from me for it is better for me to die 
than to live. What we're saying is, it's better for me to die than for Nineveh to live, than for Nineveh to have the salvation of God and the forgiveness of God. Anybody thinking like that, he has his head upside down, his feet up, and I hope you don't die like that. But he was a patriot, a patriot, he was defending Israel, a good patriot of Israel, and because of that, an enemy to the uh, people of Nineveh, but in the anger of an unsanctified patriot. Look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the anxiety of an unsatisfied person. In Jonah chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 5, so Jonah went, down, went out of the city and he sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and such under it in the shadow till he might see what will become of the city. He was saying, I hope that forgiveness is not permanent. I hope that mercy is not permanent. I hope that compassion that God had on Nineveh is not permanent. At least God has seen now that I don't agree with him. God has seen now, I am opposed to him. And I hope that God, that he knows now, I am not on his side. I hope my mood will change God. I hope my disagreement will change God. I hope my reaction will change God. I hope my rebellion will change God. Well, if your mood changes God, that's not the God of heaven. If your reaction, if your rebellion changes God, that's not the God of heaven. He was waiting there to see what will happen to the people of Nineveh. And then he tells us in verse 6, look at verse 6 there. It says, and the Lord God prepared a God and made ye to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the God. Uh, can you see the emotion of the man? Can you see this is a prophet, our prophet? Can you see this is a man that the Lord has sent on an errand that when Nineveh was, uh, was a pardon, the greatest revival that ever happened of anybody preaching, God sent him to Nineveh and the whole of Nineveh, the king and the cabinet and the people from the greatest to the least, the men and the women, everybody turned, everybody repented and they had the salvation of the Lord. It had never happened in the ministry of any other prophet. That one happened and the man was not satisfied and now leafy plants came over him like an umbrella to shield him from the sunshine or the rays of the sun and he was exceedingly glad because of that shadow, the people who are pleased and satisfied with ephemeral things, with tangible things, with earthly things, with earthly comfort, and the spiritual revival that has taken place of the conversion of hardened, wicked, violent sinners that did not interest them. Can you say they are sanctified? Can you even say they are saved? A revival has broken out in another denomination, not in our denomination. And people are repenting, and people are turning away from their sins, and people, they are making restitution, and great revival has, uh, you know, come up, and all the kind of uh, dresses they used to wear that joined them with the world, everything changed, and now they were like real children of God, saved and sanctified, and holy and purified, 
but because it's not happening in your denomination, then you put that down. What is all that? Oh, they say revival. What is all that? But this, but this, and you're trying to punch your holes in that revival because it's not happening through you. It's not happening through your pastor. It's not happening through your bishop. It's not happening through your denomination. We can get in a rut like that, and then we can say, God, how can you do that? How can you go and bring revival in that denomination? How can you go and bring revival in that other place? We are the number one. If there's going to be any revival, it should be here. Okay, I will not minister anymore if that's what God will do. We who are the real favorites of God, God is not doing this here and he's doing it over there for them. You're not sanctified and ephemeral things and useless things satisfy you. The anxiety of an unsanctified, unsatisfied person. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, But God prepared a warm when the morning arose the next day. And it smote the God that it withered. Then in verse 8, we're told in verse 8, And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and, he, and wished himself to die and said it is better for me to die than to live. That's what always happens to an unsanctified heart. They are always thinking of death. They are not thinking of life. Jesus said, I am come that she might have life and have it more abundantly. When they are not happy, they are not thinking of what Jesus has brought. They are not thinking of life. They are not thinking of abundant life. When they are angry with a man, angry with a woman, they are not thinking of what Christ has done of the life that he has brought in abundance. I prefer to die. I prefer to die. I prefer to die. I want to leave this world now. If you leave this world, where are you going? Even if you go to heaven, you'll be there empty handed. The thing that the Lord wanted you to do and the joy he wanted you to have in the service of the Lord, you didn't do what he wanted you to do. You didn't finish your work. You didn't find, find pleasure in doing the will of God. Only when that plant came up, you're happy, then it's gone. You're not happy. You're here. You're there. You're up. You're down. Your emotion is like this and that. And the wind can blow your emotion any direction. Where's the stability? Where's the salvation? And where is the security we have in Christ? It says it's better for me now to die than to live. Jonah, it's not the best time to die. When you are angry, that's not the best time to die. When you are confused, that's not the best time to die. When you are sanctified, that's not the best time to die. When you are not satisfied with the doings of God and the deeds of God, that's not the best time to die. When you are not happy with what heaven is happy with, that's not the best time to die. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, and God said, Jonah, doest thou well to be angry because of the plant and he said i do well to be angry even unto death jonah do you know who you are talking to do you know who you are replying you're replying the god of heaven the maker of the earth and the dry land and the sea you're talking to a god that has the destiny of your life in his hand i'm angry i do well to be angry even unto death when we're unsanctified we often forget ourselves we talk to god like he's an errand boy we talk to God as if he's man. We talk to God as if he's lower than man. He's a slave. He's a servant. He's an errand boy. And we can talk to him anyhow. Even though God is compassionate, yet God is not going to stomach that rude behavior against the creator. It says in um, 
Isaiah chapter 55. And I'm reading from verse 2. Isaiah chapter 55. And we're looking at verse 2. In this place, God was talking through Isaiah. And I was talking to the people, the people of God through Isaiah. He was saying that we spend our money on that which does not satisfy. We spend our energy, we spend our resources on that which does not satisfy. Satisfy. Wherefore, do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Jonah, why do you spend your breath? Why do you spend your thoughts? Why do you spend your language? Why do you spend your skill on that which satisfies not? Hacking diligently unto me, unto the Lord, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in our fatness we'll come to point number three now point number three is the answer of the unsearchable perfect one he tells us in jonah chapter four reading from verse 10 then said the lord thou hast pity on that plant for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest teach to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And then in verse 11, it says, And should not I spare Nineveh? Do I need your permission to do that? Should I not spare Nineveh? Do I need your consent, your agreement before I can do that? Should I not spare Nineveh? Should I call you to a conference with the divine, a conference with the almighty, a conference with the trinity before I act? That's why a prophet, that's why a preacher does not raise, does that raise you up to the level of divinity? Does that raise you up to to equality with God that I have to get your consent and your permission before I show mercy on Nineveh should not I spare Nineveh that great city wherein are more than three score thousand persons that is one twenty thousand people that's not the population of the city of the children that cannot discern between uh, their right hand and their left hand and also much cattle if there were six hundred thousand children those who have not gone to school and they don't know their right hand from their left hand how many mothers are there maybe six thousand mothers how many fathers are there many people millions of people there should i not spare them should I sacrifice their destiny to your anger? Should I, should I sacrifice their eternal welfare to your mood? Shouldn't I spare all those millions of people? Of course, God should. Now, Jonah did not answer that question. But if he was reasonable, he said, yes, God, I understand. You ought to spare them. And our people are there. They don't know their left from their right. They don't know the way of salvation, the way of redemption. And he's sending us as going. He's saying, go to them, go to Nineveh, and speak to them uh, the preaching that I be thee. Tell them of the Jesus who died. Tell them of the sacrifice that have been made. Tell them of the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And Pray for them and plead with them and preach passionately unto them and desire their salvation like God desires their salvation and preach and preach and preach until they turn, become penitent and they are reconciled with the Lord. And when they are saved, heaven is happy and you are happy when they are saved the angels rejoice and you rejoice and when they are saved the eternal will of God is fulfilled and your will as well will be fulfilled in Jesus name bring your heart near to the heart of 
God. Your will to the will of God. Your way to the way of God. And your desire to the desire of God. And your expectation to the expectation of God. And the mercy of your heart to the mercy of his heart. That we're in total agreement with the word, with the word of God, the way of God, the wisdom of God, and with the wonders that he performs, that he turns sinners out of their sin, and he turns them unto the Lord. Great will be your joy on earth and your reward in heaven. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <coughs> the word will not fall to them. To the ground. It will do good in every heart in Jesus' name. Yeah. We're going to pray now. We're we'll calling on our state over here to Rabba here to lead us in prayer. And then uh, the Lord Himself will shower His blessing upon every life in Jesus' name. Let's rise up on our feet. This is a time.